final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo and his banishment to St. Helena apparently ended a quarter century of war and turmoil in both France and Europe. The statesmen who had assembled at Vienna, the Austrian capital, under the presidency of Prince Metternich, the Austrian chancellor, could resume their work of reconstruction of Europe after this quarter century of disorder. The return of Napoleon for a hundred days had disrupted the proceedings at Vienna. As Metternich's secretary Gaines had said, it seemed a thousand candles had gone out. But the final defeat of Napoleon allowed them to address afresh the problem of redrawing the map of Europe, as it were, from the ravages that Napoleon had clamped upon Europe between 1796 and 1815, more specifically between 1800 and 1813-14. What the statesmen wanted was, first of all, to restore peace and order in Europe, eliminate war for the time being at least, and to restore the status quo, political status quo, anti-1789, i.e. to restore Europe of the Ancien Regime before the French Revolution had broken out. But this task was not easy. Change had been too concentrated in the quarter century for the task to be accomplished easily and for status quo anti-1789 to be established without opposition. Indeed, as David Thompson has pointed out, Europe was in a fine tension between what he called the forces of continuity and the forces of change. We would like to look at the work of the Congress of Vienna, but before that we would like to look at what these forces of change and continuity had been in the words of David Thompson to understand the tension in Europe in the period between 1815 and 1848. What are the forces of continuity that David Thompson talks about? These contained institutions. First of all, he talks of the institution of monarchy. Absolutist monarchies developed in Europe uh, since the 16th century and it was in France under Louis XIV that this institution of monarchy achieved its highest position, its apogee uh, almost. Now, the French Revolution did not overthrow monarchy to begin with, but later it established a republic. But republic as an institution did not really catch on. The experience of the American Republic had also been uh, very, very young and therefore it, is not, it did not quite percolate to, to Europe. So monarchy as an institution had not been entirely discredited, it, it remained elsewhere outside France. But even in France, the usurper Napoleon not only restored the institution of monarchy but sought to establish almost a new dynastic principle. Napoleon gave total submission to the principle of monarchy when he married Marie Louise, the princess of Austria. It was legitimacy after all that Napoleon was looking for. And therefore, if monarchy had lost much of its old magic, it has not disappeared totally 
from the consent of the people in general. People did look up to the monarchs as the most stable form of government. They had a natural sense of loyalty to the legitimate dynastic monarchy. Now, it is this principle that was reasserted. It was Talera, who had been uh, with the revolution for a very long time, who proposed the principle of legitimacy and it was applied to France, as we shall see later, by bringing back the Bourbons to the throne of France. So, monarchy, in spite of having been discredited in France, retained uh, much of its roots in Europe. And we know 19th century, uh, by and large, continued to be a monarchical century, with the exception, notably, of France after, say, 1871. A second institution that went along with monarchy was the church. There had always been a very close relation between the throne and the altar. And it was a very solid part of what we would call the old regime. The church was persecuted during the French Revolution. There had been attack on the church as an institution. There had been appropriation of the church property by the state and a massive redistribution of the church land. There had indeed even been an attack on religion, on Christianity. Napoleon undid this to an extent by signing the Concordat with the Pope and seeking to end the religious anarchy that a phase of the revolution characterized in France. The church was an ally of the old order and therefore support for the church bent support as it were for the old order. A second point to note here is that from the late 18th century and certainly in the beginning of the 19th century, there had been a kind of religious revival. It was against the dry uh, rationalism of the Enlightenment and the questioning of the religious sensibilities. Now, new men like uh, Chateaubriand, Madame de Stal, uh, Vicomte de Bonald, or even Barque in, in England, had been uh, working for a revival of religious sensibilities even uh, there was a new adoration of religion and of the church. And we shall see that in most of the restored monarchies, restored governments in Europe, church would not only be given back its position, but even the control of education, which was sought to be secularized in France, would return to the hands of the church, to the control of the church. A third institution of the old order had been the land-owning aristocracy, the most predominant social class, which depended on land ownership as its major source of income, apart from the patronage that it could receive from the royal governments. Now, land-owning aristocracy was a pillar of the old feudal order. This aristocracy was feudal in its origin. But even if feudalism largely disappeared in many areas like in France, the landowning aristocracy retained its prime position in the old uh, structure. We know that it was the second estate and a very powerful estate, appropriating to it a part of the political power and all the privileges that could be had in that society. Now, obviously, the landowning aristocracy was at loggerhead with the new classes which had been emerging as a result of economic change. The growth of trade for the last several hundred years, uh, gradual uh, coming of the industrialization, 
these were changing the society, changing the economy. And therefore, new social classes like the bourgeoisie had come up. They had money, but the landowning aristocracy resented them, resented their money, and tried to cling to the old order to kind of entrench or re-entrench their position in the society. So they were a part of the old order. And if the old order were challenged, so would be their position. So landowning aristocracy also had been largely a force in favor of continuity. To this, Thompson adds a generalized desire for peace after nearly a quarter century of warfare. Uh, this is somewhat intangible, but then probably there was a general desire to end war because war had been uh, affecting the common people. But as against these forces of continuity, we have very solid forces of change. And it is doubtful to what extent these uh, socio-economic changes could be controlled by human agencies in order to sustain the old order. These new forces, the forces of continuity, were challenging the very logic of the continuity of the old order. Amongst these, to put them very briefly, we may begin with the Industrial Revolution. It had started in, in England, or it was starting in England around the mid-18th century, and it took off, to use the metaphor of W. W. Rostow, in England at least between, uh, in, in the last two decades of the 18th century. So at the beginning of the 19th century, England was an industrial country relative to other countries at least. Now it meant the entire mode of production, the organization of production of, of labor would now be on an entirely different scale. The old domestic system would be substituted by the new factory system with large uh, factories characterizing the uh, new uh, economic organization. And this was sure to create possibilities of change. And it created a pressure that would militate against the old order. Now, we had seen earlier that the French Revolution had been seen by many as the work of the bourgeoisie, which represented the new uh, socio-economic forces. Now, industrialization, therefore, which started in England but was to spread to other countries of Europe, sure to work for change uh, sooner rather than later. And with industrialization was associated a whole lot of other movements. For one thing, we must look at the demographic growth. Europe experienced a restlessness because of very rapid demographic growth. In 1750, Europe's population was 140 millions. In 1800, it became 180 millions. 50 years later, it was 266 millions. And by 1900, it had reached a new peak of 401 millions. So it really increased threefold, nearly threefold in a matter of 150 years. It took from prehistoric times to 1750 for it to reach 140. But it nearly trebled in a matter of a century and a half. Now, this demographic growth was sure to create a restlessness in the society that could be accommodated only by change, not by clinging to the old order. This has to be read with the coming of the industrialization. It also meant there would be urbanization, increasing urbanization. By the mid-19th century, more people were living in urban areas in England than in the rural areas. In Germany, by the end of the 19th century, there would be very rapid urbanization. Indeed, it was France which was a little backward. And in France, for the urban and rural population to have an equal ratio, one had to wait till 1930. But then there is no doubt again 
that Europe was moving in the direction of industrialization and urbanization. And these were phenomena that certainly undermined the basis of the old order, which many were very keen to reestablish in 1815. Now, these changes also bred new ideas and new ideology. Nationalism was a great uh, force for change. French Revolution uh, valorized the idea of La Patrie, the fatherland, the, 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 the nation in danger. There was a great deal of uh, unity and nationalism was celebrated. In Germany, in Italy, in other parts of Europe, it gradually spread. And nationalism in course of the 19th century was both a unifying and a disintegrating force. It unified Germany and Italy. It disintegrated, for example, the Austro Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Turkish Empire. Along with this, we have liberalism, democracy, and socialism. Liberalism is what talked of the rights of the people, rights of the individuals. This is the basis on which new society needed to be articulated. If there was monarchy, there had to be a constitutional monarchy. There had to be an assembly, elected assembly, elected perhaps on the basis of restricted property based franchise, but people's rights had to be defined. The governance had to be based on some consent and it was certainly a challenge to the absolutism of your. Democracy would gradually emerge in course of the uh, 19th century. We have seen that even in enlightenment ideas, even in the ideas that influenced the French Revolution, we have this move from liberalism to democracy. Democracy would look for adult universal adult suffrage. It would look to involve the entire people in the matter of governance. And socialism, as the 19th century grew older, would address the problem of the new social class that the Industrial Revolution had spawned, the industrial proletariat. Now, obviously, all these socio-economic phenomena as well as new ideas were working for change where it would be difficult to have the old order sustained beyond a point of time. If we keep this in mind, then how history unfolded in Europe in the course of the 19th century would probably become a little clearer. Now, with this contextual uh, explication, we might now uh, try and look at what the Congress of Vienna did. The Congress of Vienna was a great assembly. Uh, it had a great ceremonial uh, attribute to it. Prince Metternich was the president and it had assembled a whole number of uh, statesmen, uh, ruling crowns of uh, uh, Europe. The purpose was to redraw the map of Europe, to prevent the domination of any power like France under Napoleon and to establish a balance of power. It has been suggested that the Congress followed three different principles, that of legitimacy, of compensation and of balance of power. We shall elaborate what these mean and see how these were achieved. Metternich obviously dominated the proceedings. He was ably assisted by Gaines, who was his secretary. Among others, there were the Prince Alexander, Tsar Alexander of Russia, but he was assisted by a whole retinue of uh, outstanding 
statesman. The king of Prussia was there, but the Prussian uh, group was laid really by uh, Hardenburg and von Humboldt. But the most wily and successful statesman here was Talera, who represented France. We must remember that Talera represented a defeated power, and therefore his responsibility was greater than those who represented the victors. Thaler had to ensure that France emerged from the Congress with a better deal, a fairer deal. Now, many historians would argue that Thaler was the best and the ablest of the diplomats here. He even succeeded in separating the old allies, the quadruple alliance which had defeated France, the, the fourth coalition which had defeated France and, and Napoleon finally. And it was his work that prevented uh, them from being united. He drew a, drew a wedge between two sets of powers and was able to secure a relatively better deal for France. What are the principles? The principle of legitimacy, it meant that all legitimate rulers must be restored to their throne. Again, this was a principle that uh, Talena had suggested and, and it was done. Louis XVIII, the brother of Louis XVI, had been restored to the throne of France, so the Bourbons were brought back as the legitimate rulers of France. And legitimate old rulers who had been overthrown were restored in most of the areas which Napoleon had conquered. The principle of compensation meant that those who have fought against Napoleon for a very long time must be rewarded for their sacrifice. And finally, balance of power meant that European powers must remain united and combined in order to prevent the overt domination of any power like Napoleon had in Europe in the first decade and a half of the 19th century. What are the basic territorial arrangements? If we look at Europe in 1812 under Napoleon, and if we look at a map of Europe in 1815 after the Congress of Vienna, we will appreciate the differences made. France had to accept her old frontier of 1790, which is virtually what France had been on the eve of the revolution, but certain accretions were permitted to France. But France lost what she had thought to be her scientific frontier. In the north, Belgium was united with Holland to create a strong state that would be a bulwark against France's expansion in that region. The confederation of the Rhine disintegrated. Rhineland was given to Prussia as a reward or a compensation. Prussia also received Pomerania from Sweden and therefore Prussia had adequate uh, compensation for the sacrifices. Austria, which laid it right through, received a Venetia for the loss of Belgium in the north. Venetia in Italy as also Lombardy were given to Austria as compensation. Austrian rulers were restored in the central Italian duchies, the old rulers, men, many of them Habsburg, like Napoleon's uh, wife Marie Louise was made the ruler of Parma. The Bourbons were restored in Naples and Sicily. Uh, the Grand Duchy of Warsaw collapsed and territories were returned to Austria, Prussia and Russia. Russia received some compensation in Southeast Asia at the cost of the decaying Ottoman Turkish Empire, areas like Bessarabia. Norway was taken from Denmark and given to Sweden and Russia received Finland from Sweden. Now, these are the major territorial arrangements of Congress of Vienna following the principle of uh, compensation and balance of power. Now, there would be a, a, a occupying force in, in France and the force of occupation would be withdrawn 
after France had paid off uh, an indemnity and all this was done by 1818. Now the Cong Congress of Vienna also did certain other things like it sought to abolish slave trade which is very commendable and it sought to internationalize the waterways in Europe for commercial purposes. You know many rivers like the Danube for example ran through several countries and it was proposed that for commercial purposes this river can be internationalized. All countries would have the right to navigate in these uh, waters. The Congress of Vienna has been criticized and has been praised. Harold Nicholson had said that the statesmen who were, were uh, not like hucksters who uh, bartered the happiness of millions with a centered smile. Another view is that the assembled statesmen were neither antiquarians nor prophets. They were merely harassed diplomats who were trying to solve the imperious problems of the present. Now understandably the work of the Congress had been both criticized and praised as I noted earlier. Uh, one point is clear that it restored peace in Europe for some time at least. Uh, there was no major war in Europe before the Crimean War of 1853-54 and that has often been cited as uh, instant of success for the Congress. It has however been uh, uh, criticized for ignoring the principles of liberalism and nationalism, uh, particularly the fact that constitutions were not granted and the greater unity was not given to France, uh, Italy and Germany are cited as illustrations of this point. Now the Congress allowed the princes to grant constitutions if they so desired. So the fault does not lie with the Congress but later it was Metternich who suppressed all constitutional movements and indeed all constitutions. Now how far Italy and Germany were ready for greater unity in 1815 is uh, uh, an open question. Historians have expressed doubt about this and probably it was uh, not very likely that the Cong statesmen at Congress of Vienna would uh, celebrate nationalism. For example, Metternich presided over a multiracial, multilinguistic empire and therefore it was highly unlikely that he would encourage nationalism. There are criticisms certainly but on the whole as David Thompson has said, Congress of Vienna was a reasonable and statesmanlike arrangement. It succeeded in providing some kind of order and rearrangement. There had been disappointments but there had been satisfactions as well. But obviously it was sought to ignore or, or it, it sought to ignore the forces of change and therefore the 19th century saw the gradual undoing of the Congress of Vienna. Music